welcome back to the Bite Attic, uh, everyone, and uh, the Cerberus uh, saga. Look what I've got here. The PCB has been manufactured. Uh, I'm very happy with it. Uh, the quality seems to be pretty high. Uh, there was a little accident uh, here at the back, somewhere here. Here, there's a little scratch, but uh, this is my own fault. These boards um, come packed together on top of one another. Uh, in a vacuum pack so they don't slide with respect to one another so they don't scratch one another but when I opened it I was careless and uh, yeah put a little scratch here but uh, didn't damage the traces so it's a perfectly usable board I have five of them now um, yeah uh, what, what else is there to say but <laughs> to say that I'm pretty happy uh, with the result. This, this was one of the largest boards I've made. You know, these days everything is SM, SMD, surface mounted, components are small, so you can pack a lot of power in a board one quarter the size of this. Uh, but for this one, I really wanted to go retro, you know, large, thick traces, everything through whole technology. Uh, so it ends up being a large board, even though it's a pretty simple uh, circuit not that complex the illusion of complexity is because the, because the packages are very large and the traces are very thick and there is full connectivity here around spacer for all the control signals so it looks like it's a pretty complex design but uh, in reality it is not that complex uh, it's uh, it's a simple 8-bit computer with some uh, enhancements that uh, you wouldn't have seen back in the day now, this is the bare board, and now the fully populated board. Uh, before we continue, let's indulge a bit in a, in a little electronics porn <laughs> with a flyover of the fully populated Cerberus board. Enjoy! quite fully populated yet um, you, you will notice that I'm not using the dual ported RAM for the character definitions instead of this I'm using this EEPROM here uh, with the character definitions burned uh, in it and the reason for that is that uh, I still haven't written the little routine in the kernel code that will be responsible for taking the character definitions from the micro SD card uh, in here and loading them during bootstrap uh, um, in the in the dual ported uh, uh, character RAM, so the computer can display something on the screen. I haven't wrote it, written that routine yet. I need to load a binary file. I have to write the code for cat to do that. I will do it in the next few days. But for now, so I can use it and test it. I'm using uh, an EEPROM for the character definitions. Um, everything else I think I've commented on before, I will give you a very quick tour of what's happening here uh, on this board. Power comes in here, 9 volts center positive uh, barrel. Uh, for that you can use you know, any standard off-the-shelf uh, 9 volt uh, 1 amp or 2 amp uh, uh, power supply. Then it goes through this diode here, just as a protection in case you connect something that is uh, uh, not center positive. Um, there is a filter capacitor here, or a decoupling capacitor, pretty large, that's the switch. And then there is a 2 amp switch mode voltage regulator. Uh, 1 amp would be enough, um, I just like to over-engineer things. Um, this is the uh, PS2 keyboard connector. And this is uh, a micro SD card adapter that I decided to use instead of requiring that uh, an SMD uh, micro SD card slot uh, be soldered on the board, which is not fun, you know, with microscopic little terminals in here. And these things are available plentifully. They are available all over the place and they cost like, I don't know, one and a half dollar, maybe three dollars. Um, this one I just desoldered uh, the, the L-shaped connectors that were here and I just put it straight through um, and I put four little holes uh, to place this thing on top of four standoffs uh, and it works pretty well there is already a micro SD card uh, in it and this is just the VGA connector 
Now, the rest uh, you are familiar with. Uh, this is Kavio and Skunk that have produced a VGA uh, video signal connected to the top side of the two dual ported memories, or in this case, uh, the top of this dual ported memory and the character EEPROM. And then on the other side, the, the, the other side, which is asynchronous with respect to this, on the other side of the dual ported memories, we have the computer proper with Cerberus in the center as the control nexus. And then we have the 6502 in here and the Z80 CPU in here. Here we have the two memories, uh, the low memory and the high memory. Maybe I should have swapped them around and put the high memory on top. <laughs> oh, never mind. This is the low memory, this is the high memory. And here is CAT, uh, the customized Atmega 328P, which has the kernel code in its onboard or ink chip uh, flash memory, 32 kilobytes, which is not much because this is a RISC processor. So the code density is much worse than uh, for the CPUs. So 32 kilobytes is not much at all to put all the kernel code in it. And that's exactly my next challenge. I need to figure out a way to squeeze uh, at least a bare minimum of the required functionality into this 32 kilobytes while not giving up on the uh, requirement that the code should be easy and didactical. Um, so I'm using, for instance, the, the normal libraries available for the Arduino uh, instead of hard coding things in a way that would save code space and make things faster. Uh, I'm just using the standard libraries. I'll try to stick to them uh, to make the code didactical and easy to understand and well supported. But if I really don't manage to squeeze a bare minimum of, fu of functionality in this, I will hard code a few things related to keyboard control, maybe I.O., uh, we, we will see. I don't want to do that, but I also don't want to release version 1 of Cerberus with less than minimum kernel functionality to make it usable. We'll see how that goes. And then these two chips here are just buffers that I use to, to um, buffer and the clock signals mainly, uh, and also to um, uh, prevent the clock signal from reaching the two large CPLDs during power on uh, in order to enable the power on reset of these chips to go on undisturbed. There are three transistors in this architecture. This one uh, is just an amplifying transistor to allow me to do some impedance matching with the VGA monitor and the other two are just switches uh, to control the power on reset process of the CPLDs. And I really did not save on bypass and decoupling. Um, there are uh, these larger electrolytic capacitors, some of them, like these three here, are 100 microfarad. They are next to these three large chips here, which switch a lot and consume a lot of power. The CPLD, for instance, has four, no, this one has eight, I think, uh, uh, VCC uh, uh, pins. This one has four VCC pins. So they pull in a lot of power and to stabilize the power signal, I'm decoupling it with this large 100 microfarad capacitors and then I'm bypassing the, the slower or the faster fluctuations using these 100 nanofarad capacitors uh, 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 everywhere uh, close to the VCC pins when I can. There are, there are two VCC pins on top but I couldn't put a capacitor in there because you know there are traces everywhere. Um, so I, I did what I could, but I didn't save on decoupling and bypass. And that translates itself. Uh, let, let, let's turn this thing on. Let's turn it on for you to see. Oh, it's already on. <laughs> Sorry, I, my plan was to start the video with the thing off, um, but it's already on. And just to give you an idea, let's take the, the power signal here of the first um, dual port of SRAM. And as you see, uh, the, uh, the, when you saw these oscillations here, it's because of the bad contact between the oscilloscope and the signal itself and the pin itself. No, now, now it's stable. Yeah, if I move it, you see that. I'll try not to move it. This is the real power signal. And you see, it does not vary. Even if I make the computer do something like access all the memories, it doesn't flinch. Uh, uh, this, this memory is switching a lot as I'm running this functionality, uh, but the power signal does not flinch. So it's, yeah, decoupling and bypass is not an issue. I'm also using the two middle layers, as I discussed in the previous episode, as VCC and ground planes. So the entire board becomes one distributed capacitor. And, and that's what you get. These tiny little oscillations here, I could filter them out using, you know, 
tiny capacitor in the low picofarad uh, range, but uh, yeah, that goes too far. <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is irrelevant. Um, the, the, the power signal is extremely stable across the board. I'm pretty happy uh, with it. Now, um, if I turn it off and on again uh, to show you again the functionality you've seen before, but this time on the real board, turn it off, give it a little time for the capacitors to discharge, and we turn it on again. Initialization, there we go. Um, there is one thing I've added. Um, I had a free pin on spacer and a free pin on cat. And then of course, when I was making the board, I thought I'm going to connect these two, three pins in case I want to add something in the future. So there is a trace already connecting these two free pins. And I decided, you know what, I'm going to use these two free pins to decide on the clock speed, which is a functionality I wanted to add in the beginning, you might, you might recall, and then eventually I gave up on it because I needed to free up some pins. But then I ended up with one pin that I didn't use. So now, I'm running by default at 4 MHz for the two CPUs, but if I type fast, then it goes to 8 MHz for the two CPUs. And I can show that uh, to you uh, on the oscilloscope as well. So we are on the 6502, and clock input phi 2 should be this pin here. So now you, you don't see any clock in there because uh, uh, it's cat uh, in control. So we have to run something on the CPU, like test CPU. So the CPU will be the 6502 at 8 megahertz. And if I type test CPU, remember that's a typewriter application, then we actually get the clock signal, which I'll try to stabilize now. Uh, let's see if I can stabilize this. Yeah, that's better. Let me recenter it. There we go. That's the clock signal, and it's 8.0000007 megahertz. Um, if we uh, uh, quit uh, running the code on the CPU, the clock signal will disappear. And then I can go back to slow mode. And uh, that brings the clock to 4 megahertz, but you don't see it yet because we have to run an application. The reason I withdraw the clock from the CPUs if I'm not running an application on them is because this will force the CPUs into a very low power standby state where they will consume them practically, practically no power, although they will be on. So it's handy to do that. But if I run the code, then the clock will be enabled. And there we have it, and this time it's 4.00004 MHz, 4 MHz, exactly as it should be. And it's the same little typewriter application that you've seen uh, before, uh, which exercises the entire communication protocol. Um, for, for people who are joining this series only now, maybe it's worth to, uh, to touch on that again, why this simple typewriter application is a nearly complete test of the communication and control protocol across the three processors on Cerberus. The reason is that um, once I start the application, then CAT, which is the system master, will hand over control to the CPU. In this case, it's the 6502 that's selected. So the C 6502 will take control of the buses and will start running its code. But if I type something on the keyboard, like a space or a letter, it is cat that will detect that I typed something. Cat is interrupted by the signals coming here from the, uh, the PS2 keyboard connector via these two lines here, which then go through two vias to the bottom side and connect to two, two pins uh, here at cat. Uh, cat detects that while the CPU is running. It detects that in parallel. It's running at the same time as the CPU. Uh, but once that key has been pressed, then cat will pause and tri-state the CPU, you know, put its uh, buses uh, into high impedance state, so CAT can take control of the data and address bus again. And then the CPU will be paused, CAT will uh, store in a location here in low memory, which I call the mailbox that address. It will store the ASCII code of the key that has been pressed, and then CAD, CAT will unpause the CPU and let the CPU run again. 
And then immediately after that, Cat will send an interrupt request to the CPU saying, hey, I put something on the mailbox, there is something waiting for you there on the mailbox. And then the CPU, which now has again control of the buses, will access the mailbox, read in the ASCII code that Cat has put in there, and transfer that to a character in the display memory, which, you, which is what you then uh, see in here. Each time I press a key, uh, this whole process that I described to you uh, will take place. Each, each time, the entire process takes place. But of course, it's lightning fast, so you don't even notice that something uh, has happened. Now, um, so now we have two modes for the clock speed, 4 or 8 megahertz. Uh, we also have the two modes for the CPU. So if I type Z80, now I have the Z80 in there. And then I have the same application written in Z8 assembly. Uh, also a little typewriter application that tests the entire protocol, but now with the Z80 here, not the 6502. If I measure the clock uh, on the 6502 now, uh, you see that uh, the 6502 has no clock because it's not selected. But if I now uh, check the clock on the Z80, which is pin 6456, there we go. Uh, we have a 4 megahertz clock while the application is running on the Z80. If I quit now by pressing escape, uh, we have no clock on the Z80 anymore. The only clock we will have uh, is here uh, on CAT, which I think is either, yeah, this is the pin, and that clock is 16 megahertz. So CAT runs at uh, twice the clock of the CPUs when the CPUs are in fast 8 megahertz uh, mode. Uh, but of course, CAT is a serial processor, so this small advantage in clock speed uh, translates at the end uh, into a disadvantage because it doesn't have parallel access to the buses. It has to do it serially, so the CPUs are in fact a lot faster for any application um, than this, this little microcontroller here, uh, which as the name implies, it focuses on control, not on processing applications. The master is this guy here. CAT, uh, even when uh, it's not controlling the system, it is handing over control deliberately to one of the two CPUs and it can take control back anytime it wants. So uh, this is it. Uh, um, it. This video is short. It's just, just to show you that, you know, the thing works. I can test the memory. Um, I can access the, the SD card, uh, which is in here. I can load uh, uh, the icon. This vertical stripes that you see in here, that th this is a display artifact. Uh, there are no vertical stripes uh, on the image itself. It, this is a very cheap, small display. I'm using it now just because using this small one, I can put everything in one frame for you. Uh, the keyboard, the Cerberus, the display and the oscilloscope, everything in one frame. That's the only reason I'm using uh, this bad quality. This is a display for security systems. Uh, uh, my normal display is a lot better than this. Um, so what else uh, uh, can we do? We can inspect uh, memory like uh, I've shown you before or the beginning of memory. Uh, we can test the CPUs. Uh, let me see which mode are we. We are in Z80. So if we go back to 6502 and uh, we go to 8 megahertz. I want to show you that the 6502 also can run fast. <laughs> can run fast. It's the same little typewriter application that uh, runs in the Z80, as you, you've seen before. Now, um, why am I adding this feature only now and why 8 megahertz? Why haven't I done this before? Um, my thinking before and it, it's wrong thinking, okay? So uh, let me admit before I even tell you uh, what it was. My thinking was that I was going to use uh, the cheapest Z80 available today, which is manufactured currently. And that Z80 is uh, rated for six megahertz. So I can run it at uh, uh, four uh, megahertz, no problem. Um, but if I want to, to run servers fast at 8 megahertz for the CPUs, then that will overclock uh, the cheap 6 megahertz Z80. And then when I was populating this board, I was looking into my parts uh, uh, stock and I could only find uh, a Z80 rated for 10 megahertz. 
couldn't find any 6 megahertz one. And I thought, yeah, whatever, whatever. I just put a higher rated Z80 in there. And then I thought, well, if I have 10 megahertz, I know the 6502 can run at um, over 10 megahertz. Um, and, and then both of them can run at 10, 10 megahertz. So, of course, they both can run at 8 megahertz, which is half the frequency of the crystal here, the 16 megahertz crystal that I'm using on this side uh, of Cerberus, the lower side. On the top side, it's a 25.175 uh, megahertz oscillator, and this frequency is given by the VGA standard. Uh, this one is given uh, by the by CAT, which can run at up to 16 megahertz. So that's why there is a 16 megahertz oscillator. And if I just use a very simple clock divider within uh, Spacer to divide that by two, I get eight megahertz. So if I use a slightly faster Z80, I can run the whole system with margin at eight megahertz. So why not do that? Because you know this. Uh, higher rated Z80 is like a few cents more expensive, I think, not even a dollar, I think, uh, maybe a dollar, I, I, I don't remember, but it's marginally more expensive than the one rated for 6 megahertz. So there is no reason to stick to that one. <laughs> so I would just re-specify re everything uh, in Cerberus, change the silk screen uh, on the board as well, to get people to buy the 10 megahertz version so we can run the system with margin at 8 megahertz. And between you and me this this is not official and then you should not trust what i'm about to tell you you know take it with a whole bag of salt but i hear that if you put the six megahertz part in here and you overclock it at eight megahertz for all you know it might just work <laughs> it might just work i don't know i haven't tried it myself but who knows um, anyway, I will specify it now for 10 megahertz, so you can run it at 8. And uh, and then we have uh, Cerberus. The, 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 the work now, other than a few things I want to change in the board, like the silk screen specifying the part number, um, the position of these uh, um, uh, pillars here, this uh, that, that you see to to uh, install the SD micro SD card adapter, the holes are a little bit too close together. I have to space them out like a millimeter or two further uh, away from each other uh, because the, the the this this pillar here is a little bit bent sideways. You probably cannot see it. It's minimal. It's microscopic, uh, but I see it. I know it's there, so I will correct it. I'll correct a couple of other things. Uh, mainly on the silk screen, I think. Oh, and there is one thing I have to do. I forgot to ground uh, the can of the PS2 connector. <laughs> that was an oversight. So I will ground the can here. Um, so very minor stuff um, uh, that I will change uh, on the board before I put it all on, um, on GitHub. Uh, I will personally not populate a new board for myself because this one turns out to know, but apart from these tiny little things that that uh, there is no reason not to change before I put it on GitHub, it doesn't justify my uh, ordering more boards from me and populating a whole new board because the functionality is all here. Everything works just fine. Um, there was only one mistake that I made, a real mistake that I made on this board, but I could correct it by just changing the pin out on cat. The mistake was the following. Uh, both Spacer and CAT have each a serial input and a serial output, SI and SO. So CAT has an SI pin and an SO pin, and Spacer has an SI pin and an SO pin, inputs and outputs serial. And they have to be connected to each other. But of course, the serial output of CAT has to connect to the serial input of Spacer. And the serial output of Spacer has to connect the serial input of CAT, so they have to be crossed. Um, but in you know when, when you're building a board, you're so used to connecting signals that have the same name, like a A0 address line zero. You know you connect A0 on this chip to A0 on this chip to A0 on that chip on this chip and there. So you get so used to connecting lines that have the same name that I connected SI to SI and SO to SO. <laughs> <laughs> output to output and input to input and of course that didn't work which sort of freaked me out when I turned this board on for the first time because I, there was only garbage on the screen the contents that the SRAM happened to have during power on and nothing was being written to it because these two guys were not talking and if they don't talk nothing happens uh, in, in servers and it took me like 
I don't know, I think I tested everything for a couple of hours and I could, could not find anything wrong and then it dawned on me that I made that mistake. Now luckily, I don't need to change the board at all. I, I, I even shouldn't, it's not the preferred way to solve it uh, because both CAT and Spacer are configurable chips. I just changed the pinout of CAT. So what was SI is now SO and what was SO is now SI. <laughs> so the signals get crossed uh, and everything worked just fine. So there are no real errors, hard or wise, uh, on this board once I make this update in the, in the uh, little sketch that uh, configures CAT. And uh, we can go to, quote, production with this board after just some little cosmetic and mechanical changes uh, here and there uh, that I don't even need to build the board again to, to, to make sure that it's correct because it's so minor stuff on the silk screen on the position of the holes that uh, it's guaranteed that uh, nothing will go to hell if I, if I make those small changes. Um, so the, the, the only remaining challenge now, and it is a significant one, it's also a bit boring, um, I have now to build the rest of the kernel functionality into CAT because right now I built all the test stuff but I also want you know, to be able to list um, assembly code not only in terms of opcodes but also in terms of mnemonics. So I need a mnemonic table that will be on a file here uh, on the SD card that needs to be loaded in, in RAM so CAT can look up the mnemonics corresponding to each opcode uh, in the instruction memory. So small things like this or a routine to move entire blocks of code from one position of memory to another instead of having to do that byte by byte. So I have to build all that stuff in a function to uh, during boot to load the character definitions here in the dual ported uh, character memory. Uh, so all these things have to be built and I am already occupying you know 70% um, of, of the space uh, in this flash memory here built into CAT. Um, it will be a challenge. I really don't want to have to hard code things in a non-didactical way. Uh, we will see how that goes. So it's a challenge and it is the challenge remaining. Once I've done that, then we will have a fully working, operational, usable, completely usable computer uh, covering both the Z80 and the 6502. So, you know, code from the old days should be very easily portable to this machine. Code from, from the TRS-80, code from the, the, the ZX-81, uh, code from the PET. Uh, these older machines that had black and white uh, displays and used uh, one of these two CPUs, all that uh, legacy code, should we should be able to port them uh, f fairly straightforwardly uh, onto uh, Cerberus. We will see. Uh, so this is a, well, it, it was meant as a very short update. I think it got a bit out of, out of hand. Um, but I will update you again once I have more kernel code built in here, and then I will show you the functionality uh, that will be implemented. For now, this is it. Uh, take care, and uh, I will see you next time.